Hello, this is Christine Pere. I'm the chair of the Area Research Committee. Welcome to today's webinar on the subject of partnerships or research consortia that conduct research on manufacturing and uh, by extension on how to bring information to their workers in augmented reality. It's my pleasure to, um, to host today's webinar on behalf of two um, very interesting research groups, one in North America and one in Europe. I'd like to uh, remind you that this work webinar is being recorded. We uh, will post the archive to the AREA website and AREA YouTube channel in the future. At the end of our webinar, we, after the presentations, we'll have some discussions and some time for question and answers from participants. If you would like to answer a question, please put that in writing in the questions utility, that feature that's part of the GoToWebinar uh, panel. And then we will take the questions uh, as they come in and I will moderate the discussion. Um, before we have our presenters um, describe to you about their, uh, their projects and their consortia, I'm going to give you a short overview about the AR for Enterprise Alliance and what the research committee is doing. And then we'll uh, have some presentations, again, as I said, in a panel discussion and questions after uh, we conclude. The AR for Enterprise Alliance is an industry consortium started about five years ago, focusing on augmented reality in industrial and enterprise use cases. But more than that, to create and to support the evolution of an ecosystem, an ecosystem that at the top and at the center really are the enterprises, large enterprises, but medium and small as well, that can use augmented reality to improve productivity, safety, security, and uh, performance at, at a larger level. And of course, uh, they are not developing all of the augmented reality technologies necessary for this process. They rely on providers of technologies and services, of course, um, to, uh, to give them the tools and the building blocks to deliver augmented reality in reliable ways. And there are also many non-commercial entities, including those that are with us this uh, today during this webinar, who are pushing the boundaries and who are doing research or supporting research uh, into different problems and challenges that, uh, that enterprises and their providers face. So this is uh, the, the highest level description of what the AR for Enterprise Alliance does. We achieve it through three, four strategic pillars or, or four strategies. We develop and deliver a lot of, of thought leadership content, and that includes webinars like this, but uh, other committees and the area as a whole uh, does host a variety of webinars. And we also participate in, a, in conferences, uh, events around the world, sharing our knowledge and uh, leadership. Try to uh, collect all of that in one place, and that's the area website. We also, through those in-person meetings and through remote meetings like this one and our uh, committees and, and, and uh, working groups, we provide a place for members to um, meet one another, share experiences, and generally ad advance the, the knowledge, share the knowledge. Uh, speaking of knowledge, we all have uh, experienced that there is a, a shortage of people who have uh, skills specifically focusing on augmented reality in enterprise and industrial use cases. And so we'd like to support uh, programs in the future and current programs and future programs that will develop um, the skills and the knowledge among employees that then can be hired by um, both providers and enterprises uh, to accelerate the development and the adoption of augmented reality. And finally, the fourth pillar are our committees. 
and they focus on different kinds of obstacles to a, to growth and to adoption. The research committee, which is the one I chair, uh, we lead a research adv an advocacy research program. So what that means is that we pool all the ideas of our area members and we invite them to um, vote on what ideas and what problems or research projects they would like to uh, receive the results of. Those research projects are funded by member dues and the benefits of the research projects are disseminated to area members in good standing. We do other things as well. We have a, develop a research agenda and we collaborate on uh, other uh, developing areas. When we find a domain or a topic that has critical mass, we try to support it uh, to fledge and, and, and create its own uh, community of interest, communities of practice. Separately from the research committee, there's also the security committee, uh, a requirements committee, and we have uh, the safety committee. We know that safety through uh, through AR is a very, very important consideration. And we've recently launched a measuring AR impacts working group. And all of these uh, uh, have their own focus and their own leadership and schedules and so forth. So I hope that uh, you, using that information, will consider your role in the ecosystem and how you can benefit from area membership. With um, with that introduction uh, completed, I'd like to invite Chris Dukuber to present about the European Factory of the Future Research Association and what you're doing and have done uh, in the domain of augmented reality. Chris, welcome. Thanks a lot, Christine, for the invitation and for the introduction. So yes, my name is Chris. I will be supported by Thanos Tsakiris from the Information Technology Institute in, in Greece. More about the role of Thanos later. So indeed, uh, EFRA is the European Factories of the Future Research Association. And we're actually the, the private partner to Factories of Future PPP. If you go to the next slide, Christine, you see on that slide that uh, you see these waves of projects that have been launched since 2010 in this Factory of the Future uh, program. This is part uh, for those who are familiar with it, with the Horizon 2020 program, the European Research and Innovation Program. Um, so it covers, this program covers uh, manufacturing really in a broad sense. So from factory automation, material processing technologies up to supply chain uh, management, product service development, etc. So it's quite broad. Uh, scope uh, and includes some uh, application of augmented reality. I will come back to that later. This program is really focused on research and innovation, meaning also that demonstration activities are very prominent in this program. It involves a lot of organizations. There's quite some critical mass there. Next slide, please. So yes, so EFRA is the private partner to the, the European U Union or the European Commission, who is actually uh, managing Horizon uh, 2020. And on a yearly basis, calls for proposals are being issued, are being published. And uh, in response to these calls, consortia, they write project proposals. And uh, if, they're, if they're retained for funding, and this is quite a competitive process, then uh, of course, with their consortium, which uh, consists of industrial companies, research and technology organizations, including universities, they uh, start a project of um, on average three to, to, to four years. Next slide, please. So actually, I um, looked into our portfolio and, and, and looked at what uh, interesting examples uh, I could bring up for, for this webinar uh, with respect to augmented reality. And um, there's one call topic from 2014 that was about developing smart factories that are attractive to workers. And this, this is really an interesting topic already, uh, you know, uh, bringing the humans in, 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 in the factories where we talk about factory automation, but we also talk about enhancing really uh, the synergy between the knowledge and the skills of the worker and, and uh, the technologies. Now, Satisfactory is really a project that looked into this, uh, combining really advanced I ICT technologies and really 
making a, a very good interface with, with the workers in the factory. So I will come to that project later. Um, so there, there's a lot of projects that focus on, on the workplace of the future. This, this is just one example of it, but I'm, I'm just mentioning this call topic because the topic is not saying this should be augmented reality. It was really chosen by the projects that augmented reality is, is really a, an interesting technology in order to develop factories, deploy factories that are attractive to workers. Next slide, please. So yes, uh, augmented reality for industry. This is a snapshot of, of a website of the Satisfactory project, which, which is still there. So you, you're very welcome and to, uh, to look into this in more detail. There's also some nice videos out there. There's a link um, in, in the presentation here as well. Um, so Satisfactory will now be presented by Thanos Sakiris. Um, but before that, and if you can go to the next slide, please, when looking into Satisfactory, I found that actually Satisfactory was already promoted uh, via the ARIA channels. So in the block of when the project was operating in, in the period of 2016, 17, there were actually some articles on the ARIA um, website in the block. So it, uh, I was quite happy to see that there was an interaction with ARIA already. So now I, I give the floor to Tanas to say us, tell us more about the details of Satisfactory. Hi everyone, uh, Christian, if you move to the next slide, thank you. Uh, Satisfactory was a project that uh, was uh, chosen by the European community in order to research uh, several different things. Uh, all of them had the worker as the center of attention, but uh, most of the actions that were required to perform this involved uh, changing the paradigm between uh, how the worker receives information and how you collect this information from the factory itself. So uh, we were trying to uh, target more, uh, most of the roles within the factory. Uh, this includes expert workers or shop floor managers and technical managers, but also the novice workers, uh, supervisors and technicians who had different requirements as to what information they had to access and in what uh, circumstances. Uh, our industrial partners in the consortium that uh, formed the project were Sunlight, which is a company in Greece that uh, produces uh, batteries for uh, heavy machinery, and Comau, who is a company uh, in Italy that produces uh, manufacturing robots uh, for the automotive industry mostly. And for uh, the project, we developed a, a platform that basically combines IoT data coming from a smart session network through a middleware uh, deployed inside the, the factories uh, in order to be able to detect events and uh, pass them into a system in the back end that provided semantic context into these events and categorize them in let's say production processes and uh, abnormal events coming from malfunctions or even emergency events coming from uh, accidents or potential accidents which I will cover later uh, and then passed into decision support system that uh, uh, it was used in order to convey the messaging uh, to whoever party was responsible in order to uh, either uh, manage this, pro this event or to warn about a specific issue that may happen. In that respect, the interface to get this information uh, in most cases was uh, produced in augmented reality uh, displays. We covered three different types of displays situated inside uh, the factory itself in uh, screens, uh, head mount displays, and tablets that will be carried by the, the workers. And all this was uh, accompanied by an operational platform with augmented intelligence in order to be able to convey this information in uh, multiple channels. Uh, if you will move to the next slide, please. OK, uh, in uh, Comau, the shop floor, uh, you can see in the photographs here, was in uh, uh, Torino, Italy, and uh, they were uh, producing normally uh, robots in this uh, factory floor without the use of any uh, smart interfaces when we came in as a project. So uh, we tried to introduce several different uh, technologies, basically for uh, 
emergency response, uh, what happens when uh, you have a collision between a robot and, an, uh, and a worker, what happens uh, when you have uh, somebody crossing an, an area that is not uh, allowed to go into and things like that. Uh, if you move to the next slide, please. Okay, what they produce, what the use cases for the Comau uh, shop floor were, it was commissioning uh, in order to support the engineer activities, in order to basically create a digital representation of what the production line is to be producing in, when they uh, install their products in their customers, let's say the robots in an automotive uh, factory, training, training and operation for the workers themselves in order to produce, uh, to, to improve the production cycle, and maintenance in order to enhance the maintenance project uh, process, helping the staff uh, in reducing the time to repair. So uh, this was used in uh, body welding and robot assembly, and I will not go into detail in what exactly they were doing there. In the next slide, please, uh, Christine. Yes, uh, and uh, in sunlight, the processes that we try to cover uh, with the solutions that we provide as a project were real-time support uh, in the production lines, uh, event and incident logging, and the learning environment for new workers and new processes that needed to be introduced inside the factory. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Uh, some of the prototypes that were uh, the result of this project were uh, from the hardware side an augmented reality uh, glasses system provided by the glass up company that was part of the consortium these are mostly head mount uh, display in a form of uh, head up display not a stereoscopic uh, head mount display like a hololens which was basically used in order to convey notifications and instructions in the form of images and text and audio but not in a 3D form. So this was the first, let's say, uh, introduction into an augmented interface. Next slide, please. But the main part of the AR uh, technologies that we introduced were a complete training system that was based on having on one end uh, a development uh, platform for creating these operating procedures uh, and uh, organizing them into a step-by-step -step tutorials uh, system that was then uh, used in head mount displays, in tablets, uh, with uh, augmented markers and uh, other interfaces in order to be used in an augmented reality uh, sense. So in, with this respect, uh, this was, let's say, the front end for all the workers in uh, the companies that were involved in uh, Satisfactory. In the presentation tool, they could see how to perform an operation step by step. We could detect using uh, object uh, recognition technologies what the object uh, was supposed to be in what state, in what step of the operation. And uh, we also had verification algorithms uh, implemented in order to understand what are, were uh, the activities performed by the workers in order to see if the activities were performed correctly or not and provide some uh, feedback at the end. Uh, at the end of uh, each procedure, uh, whether this was for training in production or uh, in a maintenance, in a maintenance uh, sense, it was to provide at the end analytics to the uh, supervisor of these workers to understand what was happening correctly and what was happening incorrectly or in a, a slow manner uh, based on what they could see at the end of its procedure. We would, we would do this by uh, logging each activity of the user and then uh, combining that information with, uh, let's say, a baseline of how the procedure was supposed to happen in uh, a perfect world, see what could be improved uh, in the procedure itself or in the training itself. Next slide, please. Christine. So, uh, in order to support this at the back end, we had a decision support system that uh, basically was used in order to uh, reschedule uh, activities based on priorities and uh, assign roles to workers and uh, activities based on the requirements of its day. So you had a schedule in the beginning of the day and then you had events coming from the smart systems installed within the factory and these events 
uh, rearrange the schedule accordingly if there was an emergency, for example, or if there was uh, a task that was carried on a bit too much and this affected other tasks. And all this came as, in the end, as notifications to the workers responsible to go and perform these tasks. Uh, next slide. Uh, one other prototype uh, that was very important in the back end to support the augmented reality interface in the front end was the context aware manager. So in this uh, respect, the, we developed a localization manager that uh, was used in order to situate uh, where the worker was inside the premises and have, uh, as you can see in the left image there, uh, some red areas which were uh, not allowed for the worker to go in for security reasons. And then uh, we also had the gesture and the content recognition manager that was used in order, for example, to identify if uh, the PPE uh, equipment was worn uh, correctly by the workers. We also had installed the depth and uh, thermal camera incident detection system uh, in both uh, factories, both in Comau and uh, sunlight in order to detect uh, upcoming uh, events, for example, uh, thermal runaways in uh, electrical panels or uh, collision uh, detection probabilities and notify the users accordingly uh, directly in the head mount displays or in the uh, augmented reality interface that we're using at the time. Next slide, please. This was all uh, encompassed by an, uh, a social platform that was uh, developed in order to convey this information even uh, in uh, an offline mode to the workers in a way that it was attractive to them and it provided uh, information and collaboration uh, interfaces for several things that they could uh, perform. For example, there was a gamification engine uh, developed that uh, assigned uh, awards to each correct operation uh, that uh, the worker could uh, perform, for example, in training. We had uh, a system where uh, the fastest uh, worker to perform uh, a training operation received uh, an award. And there also was a suggestions uh, system for workers to uh, provide their own suggestions and to how to improve production, how to improve, uh, improve processes, etc. A digital andon was a, sc a screen set up in several uh, areas within the factory in order to provide timely information in how to perform uh, operations. Uh, also, as I mentioned earlier, there was a notification system coming in to directly to the head mount displays. And uh, finally, a dashboard where the, all the analytics that were gathered from the smart uh, sensors and the training uh, system that I described earlier could be uh, graphically presented to supervisors. Next slide, please. Uh, in order to pro, uh, support the localization uh, interface, there was a company within the consortium that developed uh, ultra-wide band localization and uh, ergonomic sensors. Uh, these were uh, transceivers situated in uh, interior uh, space within the factories and they could provide interior localization because, as you know, it's not is, uh, possible to have a GPS kind of system uh, running inside the factory. So we use this in order to uh, support this emergency and safety uh, services provided by SETS factory. Uh, next slide, please. And finally, uh, I want to conclude by saying that uh, after the end of this project, uh, ourselves, uh, ITI, the Information Technologies Institute, and a company that was part of the consortium, Regola, uh, we came together and formed a spin-off company, and we developed the platform for training workers on the job using augmented reality uh, further, and basically in the last two years we are active in this respect. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks a lot, Thanos. Thank for you, this Thanos. Slide. Yes. Right, so uh, here are um, some other examples of projects that involve the deployment and development of augmented reality uh, solutions and technologies. So Reform is a project about, um, well, environmental sustainability of, of manufacturing of the factories of the future involving uh, composites. And here um, the augmented reality uh, technologies were used for 
supporting uh, the workers that require hand-free instructions in, in the, the layering process, so the positioning of the plies, uh, reducing scrap and waste, so improving quality and also having, uh, of course, then also an environmental impact in making things right. The HORSE project is a project focused on, on robotics and the associated Internet of Things um, technologies that, that facilitate, that enable dynamic manufacturing. Uh, there, there are basically two pointers uh, to, uh, to assist humans and including the notion of safety. Safety was mentioned also before by Thanos. I, uh, I believe this is also an important um, value added, added value of, of augmented reality. Uh, not only efficiency, but really the safety of, of the worker. And the second point focuses on, on the quality aspects of inspection stars that are supported by super, superimposing information in a user-friendly manner. The, what is important here, I find, is that it, uh, it mentions that there's a wealth of monitoring information. So we all talk about, well, there's a lot of talk about big data and a lot of sensors being uh, available in the factories. The point is to, well, to, to, to create information that is manageable and that is interesting for, for the worker to really be able to do his job in the in the best possible way. So, really, uh, the joining the the big data with with uh, what what users really want is is important here. Next slide, please. Uh, one question, Chris: Are these projects currently ongoing, or have they concluded? The, the, these have concluded. Yes. Okay, Actually, all you. the examples of the projects I mentioned are concluded projects. There has seems to have been a wave of projects that really were keen to deploy uh, augmented reality. But I'll come back to some future opportunities later. Um, so ESR3 is focusing on maintenance activity uh, associated also to repair activities. So skills were, were mentioned as well as, as, as one of the pointers or supporting and the humans in terms of skills, well, you can you, you can require skills for augmented reality, but augmented reality is also an enabler for assisting people that not necessarily have all the exact skills that are required for doing uh, some manipulations or maintenance. So the support here in terms of maintenance is important, maintenance or repair. Next slide, please. This slide is uh, the project, um, actually, No For Car. The title is, the, the, the acronym is not there, but I, I, I remember, um, which is, uh, well, there's some videos there that, well, show you the typical situations where there's a projection of some particular um, uh, parts of the big component where the user should focus on in order to do the assembly uh, operations right. So this is uh, really a pro uh, project that focuses on assembly as supported by augmented reality. Next slide, please. Again, more looking in the robotics side and humans associated to robotics. So this uh, lean automation project uh, deployed um, augmented reality in automotive sector, uh, where actually in the assembly lines, um, the workers were actually supported. Um, the human co human robot cooperation is is also a very um, big topic in in the research and innovation for factories of the future, and it's important to note that actually augmented reality can support uh, human robot cooperation. Of course, you can have some some gesture recognition. There's different technologies involved, but uh, this example is is there to show that augmented reality in the context of human robot cooperation can also be uh, very interesting. Next slide, please. And now, uh, before concluding, um, mention I would like to mention this this project, which is more an overall supporting project that looks into the digitalization, the digitalization of manufacturing from different perspectives, uh, where we are developing some pathways, we call them, where you have less advanced uh, status of digitalization in companies and then more advanced uh, situation of, of digitalization. And we, we really wanted to make clear this is a pathway covering factory automation that the humans being actively connected is a very important part of this. Uh, so there's, that involves many technologies, including augmented reality, as, as shown in the, in the examples before. Next slide, please. Right, so um, for those who want to dig into this, please feel free to look at uh, this through the AFRO website or you Google Connected Factories here, you'll find more information about that. Um, this is an ongoing process. Um, 
I refer to to connection to IoT to sensors to really all these different factors that make companies progress on the pathway to digitalization. So th this is I would like to what I would like to stress. It's it's good to have good examples, but also to to explain how you get to these advanced stages of digitalization. Next slide, please. Right, so um, there's a portal, portal.fr.eu, where you would find uh, these projects and, and many more projects uh, of the Factories of the Future uh, PPP. So uh, feel free to, to have a look there. Uh, and then with the last slide, I would like to, um, to point to the calls for proposals that are open also through the EFRA website. You will find that uh, under the menu item about calls for proposals, where um, the ongoing, uh, well, the, the currently open uh, calls are being mentioned. The deadlines are pretty soon, so that's, that's uh, mid-January, beginning of February. Uh, I would like to refer to, to or, or point at this artificial intelligence for manufacturing call topic that you see there, the ICT38. There's a lot of interest uh, for, for this uh, call topic. I assume since also this call topic is referring to the interaction with humans, and well, there's a lot of talk about how humans interact with artificial intelligence, who is in control, etc. Uh, so there will be quite some focus also on the role of humans. And I, I would suppose that augmented reality could also be a technology that would be very relevant for supporting this interaction. Next slide, please. Well, that's it from, from our you. side. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Fantastic. Uh, very, very uh, clear and exciting. <clears throat> and I hope many people on the call and members uh, watching the archive will think to to explore those calls and to learn more about the projects that have been completed already. Very significant uh, number and depth of projects that that could be relevant to us. Thank you again. And now I'd like to uh, give the stage, <laughs> the podium to Sina Cooper, who is the director of R&D at the Manufacturing Times Digital Program in America, MXD USA. Uh, Sina, can you help, can you hear me? I can, good morning and good afternoon, depending on where everybody's located. Great, thank you, it's good to hear your voice. And uh, welcome, and just let me know when you want me to switch the slide. And would you please introduce okay. yourself um, sure. as well? Uh, so I am Sina Cooper. I'm the director of R&D projects here at MXD. And I'll, in the next couple of slides, um, speak to what we are all about and then um, walk you through some um, projects that we have done using AR. Um, and I just want to thank Christine for the opportunity to speak with all of you this morning. Um, and let's go ahead and get started. So, um, some of you may have heard of MXD in our prior kind of incarnation. Uh, we were known as DMDII, which is a mouthful, which is one of the reasons that we have transitioned and rebranded. Uh, we were known as the Digital Manufacturing and Design Innovation Institute, which is a mouthful. Um, so, we rebranded earlier this spring into MXD, so Manufacturing Times Digital. Uh, we're located in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, we are one of 14 federally funded institutes that are part of the Manufacturing USA program uh, that was established during the Obama administration in 2014. Uh, it, is in, it was created to really spur the development of uh, disruptive technologies that are key to revitalizing the capabilities of the U.S. manufacturing base. Each institute is built on public-private partnerships, um, and most of them focus on a specific technology area, uh, like additive manufacturing or advanced robotics. Um, MXD is unique in that we focus on digital innovation, um, so that obviously cuts across a lot of those different areas, um, and this enables our manufacturers to um, to utilize and learn about new technologies to communicate with one another um, and glean some insights that were previously untapped. Uh, slide, please. So MXD, um, as I mentioned, is a public 
private partnership, um, primarily with the U.S. government, the Department of Defense. Um, we also have industry and academic members as well. Um, and again, focusing on the digital capabilities um, in the U.S. defense industrial base and supply chain. Um, we have, let's see, um, we launched, as I mentioned, in 2014 um, with an initial round of funding from DOD in the, about $70 million. Um, we, the additional contract ended and we now have a second, a renewed contract, um, which is again with DOD for up to $60 million over the next five years. We have 320 plus members, um, again, anchored by DOD and um, some large Fortune uh, 100 companies, and we'll go through those again briefly in a moment. Um, over those past five years, we have done 60 plus projects. Uh, these are really applying technologies to real world applications. We have a fantastic facility. We have over 100 square feet, 100,000 square feet. Um, of an innovation center, uh, which includes a large manufacturing uh, factory floor that includes our future factory. And we also have a digital capability center um, that is a joint project between MXD and McKinsey. Um, that is the only one in the Americas. And we welcome people to come and visit. So if you're ever in the Chicago area, uh, please come in and stop by and see all the great things we're doing. Slide please. Uh, so as we've discussed, um, you know, we're looking at digital manufacturing, which cuts across a, a whole variety of things. So we focus on design, uh, future factory, and supply chain across the entirety of the digital thread. And we also take into account um, workforce and cybersecurity as well. So we're really looking at a very broad um, impact on digital manufacturing. Slide, please. So we have um, members and we have different tiers. That is what um, kind of leverages our organization. We have um, five tier one members, again, you know, some large companies, um, tier two as well. Our value proposition really is all about our network. Um, we are trying to target problems that are too big for any, for any one um, organization to solve. Um, and if you look, it's interesting to see we've got some competitors um, in this, and you know we provide sort of a safe collaborative space. So John Deere and Caterpillar, for example, um, you know normally don't work together, um, but in our organization they are able to do that. So we form, we don't form the teams, but we, um, and we'll get into some project conversations in a moment. But we do, you know, look to teams to be formed with between industry academia, um, and then, uh, you know, small manufacturers as well. So we're looking both at the large side and the small side. Um, so slide, please. So this is just a very brief list, list of our academic partners. Uh, this allows us to keep our eyes on uh, kind of what's out there in the future uh, that might impact manufacturing in the years to come. And again, we encourage a academic partner to be on our project teams as well. Slide, please. And then we have a whole host of um, what we call tier three. So these are typically um, small and medium manufacturers, which, as most of you probably know, make up a large chunk of the manufacturing um, base, at least in the US. Um, you know, I don't know what the number is. It's 95%, I think, are, are small and medium sized manufacturers. So um, they are an excellent foundation um, for us as well. So again, for our projects, we encourage um, small and medium, along with our um, our big guys as well. Slide, please. So our partners um, receive value through three different primary initiatives that we focus on. So the first one is workshops. Uh, these are topic-based uh, sessions. We recently had a uh, workshop on 5G that AT&T presented. Um, and then we also recently actually had one on cybersecurity in manufacturing that was uh, phenomenal. Um, the second thing that we really focus on is projects, and that's what I will get into a little bit more detail about. So these are collaborative R&D focused um, projects to improve uh, things in the digital manufacturing world. And then the third one is test beds. Um, 
So I will, I think on the next slide, talk a little bit about sort of what we have at our facility um, from a test bed perspective. So if you'll move to the next slide. So these are just some examples of what we have on our floor. Um, the first one on the upper left is our discrete test bed. So this produces um, souvenir coins and reports some live data. The line is equipped uh, with a multitude of sensors that monitor everything from ambient temp to machine vibration. Uh, the data is available to our members if they are looking for a data set to do some um, analysis on. And then the other thing that this line has on it is an opportunity to record the unique digital fingerprint of each coin. So this is as if it had a serial number on it, but it does not. Um, it's just the unique material um, structures that allow us to identify it just like a fingerprint. On the top right is our cyber process skid. So this is a work in progress right now. Um, it's a demonstration with clean water supply, and it focuses on detect, recover, and then respond uh, to a cyber intrusion of the PLCs. Bottom left is our cyber wall. This is an opportunity to look at um, essentially a protected set of um, equipment versus an unprotected set um, in the cyber uh, area. So looking at identify and protect um, areas of the NIST framework um, on that cyber wall. And then last is our learning lab. So we have a new um, activity, MXD Learn. So this is an opportunity to really focus on workforce development. Um, our learning lab is just a dedicated area in the middle of the factory um, where we can bring in, um, you know, operators or students or whomever for um, some development and hands-on learning. Next slide, please. So looking at our project portfolio, as I mentioned, we've been around for about five years. Um, we have completed 63 projects. Uh, we have some that are winding down, and then we have some that are also ramping up. Uh, these are the four areas that we really have focused on over those years. Um, first is product development, uh, second, future factory, and then cybersecurity, as I mentioned, and then lastly is supply chain. Um, we are really focusing on reducing uh, the time from R&D to practice. Um, the one big thing I do want to mention is the intellectual property that's developed uh, during all of these projects is available to our members, um, and that's based on their tier level um, as it's outlined in our membership agreement. There are high-level um, final reports and summaries talking about the results of these projects, but any of the um, you know, technology and intellectual property is not readily available uh, to the public. Moving to next slide, please. So just to give everybody an idea of what our project process looks like, um, and then we'll talk about some specific AR projects. Uh, we essentially canvas um, our members, including the um, DOD and academia, um, for input on use cases and pain points in the digital manufacturing space. You know, what keeps them up at night? Um, and then we synthesize those into project themes and scope the topics into more detail. Uh, we then develop requests for proposals, so project calls, um, as was mentioned with the last um, presentation. We release those on our website and then also via email. Um, and I would encourage anyone who's interested to sign up for our free uh, mailing list just by going to our website. It's mxdusa.org. And anyone um, is able to respond to our request for proposals. We do encourage the formation of teams. We ideally like to see um, at least one academic um, and one uh, large industry partner and potentially a small industry partner as well, along with solution providers. Uh, an organization must become a member of MXD if their proposal is down selected and we move forward with award negotiations. But it is open for anybody to read uh, the RFPs and then also to respond to them as well. Um, and then we typically have a cost share requirement. So for every dollar of government funding, uh, we expect a dollar of in-kind labor and materials in aggregate from the team. So if we're awarding $100,000 um, towards a project, then we expect the team in aggregate to provide $100,000 um, in-kind as well. Uh, next slide. 
So jumping now into what I think everybody's probably been waiting for, um, some specific AR um, examples that we had. So this was a project that was done several years ago, um, completed in early 2018. This one is entitled Authoring AR Work Instructions by Expert Demonstration. So this was led by one of our academic partners, Iowa State, in partnership with Purdue, along with Boeing and Deere and DACRI and Design Mill. And this was intended to develop something called the Augmented Reality Expert Demonstration Authoring, so AREDA product, uh, to rapidly author AR work instructions by recording the activities of an expert uh, using 3D cameras. So it's essentially capturing their demonstration of the assembly procedure that could then be passed along to an assembly operator via AR. The academic partners in this case, again, Iowa State and Purdue, worked on the technical objectives, um, including the refinement uh, of the automated authoring algorithms and the output of work instructions to digital file formats suitable for use by AR viewers. The large manufacturers, Boeing and Deere, provided real-world manufacturing expertise and requirements definitions. And then finally, the technology sales companies provided the commercialization plan and additional market requirements. Uh, next slide, please. So two more examples of um, augmented reality on our factory floor. Uh, the first one on the left is um, using AR work instructions. So this is, we have a Black & Decker uh, drill line. So this is um, a set of uh, discrete assembly operations to build um, a Black & Decker drill. So this includes technology to assist with inventory tracking and root cause analysis. Um, there are a lot of different vendors that were involved with this line um, showcasing some different technologies. Uh, there's an opportunity to notice some worker issues, um, identifying you know, kind of best and worst performers, uh, some best practice uh, for, for task fit. You know, so this worker this, you know, does better at this type of task versus a different one. Um, and identifying whether, you know, if there's a slowdown in um, efficiency, whether that's an early sign of injury or worker morale. Um, so that, again, you know, if you happen to hit Chicago, that would be a, this would be a great thing to take a look at. Um, and then we also have on our floor, I know this is not AR yet, um, we have a virtual reality workforce training um, example. So this was developed as a training tool for engine repair with Rolls-Royce helicopter in partnership with um, a company called Vision 3. Uh, the second phase of this project is for Rolls to leverage the models and the intellectual property to develop an AR solution for mechanics in the field. So we're excited to see um, how that plays out, and that should be over the next couple of years. Uh, next slide, please. So we have a current, um, or about to be, current um, request for proposal. So this will be released uh, probably the week after Thanksgiving, so the first week of December, um, entitled Human Workflow Digital Twin. So the intent here is to develop and demonstrate a solution that augments a worker through real-time data collection, modeling, scheduling, and feedback in order to optimize their interactions with the manufacturing system. So as I mentioned, this will be released um, in a couple weeks. Um, our hope is to have some great responses, um, and then we go through and we will downselect and move forward with the project. Um, this is anticipated to be a 12-month project. Um, the funding from MXD will be somewhere in the $500,000 to $700,000 range, just to, again, give you a, an idea of um, scope here. Um, kind of four different key objectives on this one. Um, one is manufacturer engagement. Um, so engaging with a manufacturer, um, identifying a use case with a human in the loop solution um, that is then extensible to the broader manufacturing community. Second one is a human feedback loop. Uh, so developing some algorithms that can digest the sensor data and provide real-time feedback to the operator um, in a format suitable for the proposed use case. Third objective is enterprise system integration, so integrating the developed technologies into a um, some prevailing factory scheduling system, uh, knowledge management system, or uh, manufacturing execution system to enable 
uh, the use of the human model in existing workflows. And then the fourth objective is to focus on um, a system demonstration. So staging, de-risking, and demonstrating the proposed solution on an assembly, discrete, or process test bed, uh, depending on what makes sense, um, either at the manufacturer's location or um, on MXD's factory floor. So look for that to be released soon. And as I mentioned, um, getting yourself on the MXD uh, mailing list would be a great way to become informed of that. I also will make sure that Christine received it, receives it, and then she can send that out to everybody as well. All right, yes, next slide. In fact, uh, maybe in December we can uh, have a, a few comments, a few minutes describing this again for the research committee. So we'll yes. definitely keep on top of that. Mm -hmm. Yep, and then just, I think this is the last, second to last slide in here. Just again, I mentioned it before, but we have um, a new program, MXD Learn. So this is our workforce development program um, that we are focusing on you know, everywhere from high school to uh, community college to universities and apprenticeships, um, looking at, you know, how, how workforce development fits in with the whole digital manufacturing um, area. So that, I believe, is the end. Okay. Great slides. Thank you very much, Sina and Chris and Thanos. Um, so, this has been, um, we have some time remaining for uh, discussion. And um, the topics that we're going to kind of uh, focus on, at least to, until we have some questions from the, uh, the attendees, are the following. Uh, we have, I think, largely answered how can area members and others uh, who are not area members today, um, get involved in some of these consortia and submit proposals for, for funding on these projects. So I think uh, that topic has been uh, very, very well answered, so I appreciate that. I think uh, we'll, we'll dig down a little bit more into some of those practical questions about how do you study and, and how do the results um, get distributed? So I'd like to then um, first ask uh, Chris and Thanos if you could make any uh, proposals or suggestions about uh, methods for studying the impacts of augmented reality uh, in, the, in the factory. And is it a matter of uh, video recording everything or is are there electronic means or other ways to measure the impacts of these technologies maybe they're subtle but maybe they're very strong do you have any comments or can you add anything to that maybe uh, could i ask a question about when you when you say impact christine you you mean the impact of the introduction of augmented reality yes. in the factories uh yes. well in all in, dimensions in on right. performance on the right. humans right so in, in any dimension right so since the program is associated to um, demonstration activities and i think that's also clear in the, in the presentation from sina and the point is in, 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 in getting it done in an environment that is close enough to the industrial environment, if, if it's a lab environment, in order to, yeah, to see the, the improvement in terms of safety, in terms of uh, quality, in terms of even involvement, workplace uh, satisfaction of the workers. Um, so, of course, the measurement of, of, of impact is always uh, a tougher question if you come to the point of, okay, what, what's the actual gain in terms of speed, et cetera, et cetera, because there's many factors involved. But maybe since Thanos uh, was very much involved in Satisfactory and the associated demonstrators, Thanos, can you comment uh, how you experienced this? Yes. Uh, well, counterintuitively, actually, um... It seems that uh, most of the pilot sites that we use the uh, AR technologies uh, with the actual uh, employees there, uh, they tend to prefer, let's say, not the cutting edge. Uh, 
they prefer, let's say, tablets to head mount displays. They prefer something that they are already accustomed to rather than something that uh, they first see for the first time in their lives and uh, they, other than the wow factor, they do not really trust in how it's going to affect their everyday operations. So I would uh, say counterintuitively again that uh, baby steps are I think are more uh, functional than actually going there with the cutting edge. Uh, from uh, either from the manager's point of view, when they tested things uh, with augmented reality interfaces, the problem was not with actually the augmented reality itself, but the devices and the interfaces provided by the hardware that is currently ex in existence. For example, Hololens or uh, Magic Leap. Uh, they do not get the paradigm easily of how to interact with augmented reality. So they tend to prefer systems that are, let's say, a bit easier uh, and everybody has seen in their lives, like smartphones and tablets with a touch interface, even if you use it as a window uh, to experience augmented reality. Uh, with that, uh, yeah. It's yeah. when, you, when I talk about measuring the impacts or the methods to study the impacts, uh, in the satisfactory project, didn't you have a way of capturing every yes, interaction with the digital world or the physical world? Okay, mm -hmm. and that's in contrast with maybe using cameras to record what the user is doing and how their behavior may change. There's also time and motion studies that yep. are done with cameras. We the have performed this, yes, actually. Uh, as I mentioned before, we had an analytics system uh, in our uh, training uh, on the job system with augmented reality. And uh, through that, we measured uh, all the times between each step performed and how many errors uh, were induced. And the thing is uh, that in the small time that we had in uh, the project, you cannot get a really big statistical uh, base for that mm -hmm. in order to, mm -hmm. to have an impact assessment. Uh, but uh, the overall uh, measurement that we had was positive, not, you know, uh, highly uh, positive, like 50% uh, decrease in time or something like that. It was more in the realm of 10%. Uh, yes. but, but what we got there was more something that you cannot really measure. Um, it is the qualitative approach to how a, a worker is satisfied by doing something, not by uh, reading it in a paper or in a manual or having somebody teach them outside of the workplace and then having to apply it in the workplace. As far as training, we saw a very good result in the interface of having something in front of you and learning by watching something being performed in front of you. Okay, thank you. That's a very complete answer. Uh, Sina, I wonder if um, we could ask one more question of both of you and ask you to begin. Uh, in, the, in the members of the consortium, the, the MXD consortium, do you see any changes, maybe in the last uh, 12 or 24 months, in uh, how people think about augmented reality when when they're in the factory or they're in the you know, are, are, have you noticed any changes in attitudes or any um, uh, new kinds of questions that people are asking? Well, I think I think people are more open to it. Um, I know that when we talk with our smallest. Um, manufacturers, you know, they, they're they still trying to figure out if IoT, you know, meets their needs. I mean, they're, not that they're behind, but they're just trying to understand what technologies, you know, to embrace. And I'm, and I think AR is not even on their radar yet, um, mm -hmm. you know, but with, with the larger manufacturers, you know, definitely, um, as I mentioned, you know, we have a project uh, with, that started with Rolls. Royce on um, on the VR side of things that is going to transition into a um, into an AR project mm -hmm. um, and use case that I think is going to be fantastic. And my hope is as these things um, you know get developed that they will proliferate even more as we show how valuable they are. 
Right, right. Okay. Chris, uh, how about on your side? Do you notice any changes in the conversation, how people talk about the use of these technologies today compared to a year or two ago? Well, uh, I, I would also support the, um, the, the reasoning that when I, when, we're, when I refer to the pathways, many companies are on the way to implement digital technologies. And indeed, as Sina said, AR is, is one technology. And on top of it, considering the, um, the, the glasses or the, the head-mounted displays, it is quite, um, it's technology that, that really comes very close to the human in terms of using that system. So um, I, I think the intermediate steps, uh, as mentioned by Thanos, like uh, iPads or, or screens that support uh, better uh, the user, uh, considering the, the feedback that the user gives that anticipate, okay, this user needs more support uh, from a particular angle because the system senses that there's a requirement there, that there's many different technologies that can support uh, a user before getting to the to the stage of augmented reality. I think uh, it should not be dropped in there as as the holy grail. I think the, the whole the whole point of, of of innovation is that there's different aspects that are being covered and acceptance. Is, 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 is an important thing. Um, involving the workers in, in how their workplace changes is, is an important aspect. So uh, I think the use of augmented reality, for instance, for training purposes as, as, a, as a first step is one example of introducing the concept, which is not straight away using augmented reality and head-mounted displays anytime in the factory, but just some, some uh, occasions where the workers are using Gradually. augmented reality in a particular in a particular context. I think this would help, or this helps. Yep, I agree. And uh, I think there was another uh, comment that you you had made when we were uh, discussing these topics earlier. You said it's less and less a question of if these technologies will become useful, and um, there's more questions about when or how. And, and so this is that is that uh, something you've noticed? Well, you, we don't have to take any everything for granted. Like it should be like that. It's it's not that we should impose technologies and say don't ask yourself uh, if, but only when, because the involvement of all the decision makers should be that they really see the need. Uh, all comes from the need of of being more competitive, being more um, performing in terms of quality. Uh, in terms of uh, being responding to user requirements, the environmental aspects it's, aspects come in very strong, uh, skills aspects. So uh, it, it's all about that and, and, and people believing that they require uh, some technologies that could make the difference. Um, Great. We should look at it from that perspective, okay. I think, first. Yes. 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 Um, well, we are out of time. I'd like to thank you very much for your participation in this webinar. And I want to remind people, if they are not aware, that we are focusing a, a workshop uh, in January on the topic of uh, the requirements for interoperability, specifically in a factory environment, in a shop floor. And uh, I think that the use case is so important that it is um, central to the conversations. And I, I look forward to having many more conversations with uh, our speakers and uh, our community on these important topics. So uh, without further ado, uh, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, have a great day. Thank you.